Hi everyone and welcome back to my channel. You guys seem to really enjoy my top 15 farmhouse Dollar Tree DIY video. So I thought I would take my top 20 Dollar Tree farmhouse DIYs that I have created since then and compile them into this one video. I hope you enjoy today's projects and if you haven't done so already, I would love for you to click that subscribe button and become a part of our Country Lily DIY community. I would also love for you to visit me on all my other social media accounts. All those links are in my description box below. So with that being said, let's get started. 3 8 inch dowels from Walmart as well as a smaller dowel out of a package from Dollar Tree. I'm going to make a mark at one inch and cut that down. I'm using my handheld miter shears. If you are interested in these, I also have this listed in my Amazon store in my description box. I cut three of those down and then I'm going to sand them down nice and smooth on each end. And then for the smaller dowel, I just eyeballed it. I don't know exactly how long they are because they're pretty small, but I want to attach these to the dowel to create the handles for our drawers. So you'll need six of those. And I just marked them off all to make them the same size. I just used the first one as a guide to create the rest of those and attached the two smaller ones to one piece with some hot glue. And I just found that it was easier to just hold it in place and then just kind of eyeball where you want to put the second one because everything's so small. So you'll create three of these handles in the same way. Now I'm showing you a fourth one because I had thought originally about putting this on the door, but I ended up not doing that. So I only used three of them. Using three of these drawer inserts or drawer boxes from Dollar Tree, we're going to remove the drawers and then attach the three bottom pieces together using some Gorilla Wood Glue and hot glue. And trying to, well, you try to want to make sure that they're all kind of even because not all of these boxes are the same size when you get them from Dollar Tree. And then I'm just going to place some Dollar Tree clamps on there and hold it in place until that wood glue sets up. For these drawers, I'm just going to flip them around and use the back side of each of the drawers as the front side and give each one of the fronts of the drawers one coat of Waverly White chalk paint because I thought that I would just leave the sides and the inside with the raw wood color and painted each one of the handles with the same white paint. So the top part, I wanted to seal those seams up to give it a nice finished look. So I'm using some spackling on the seams at the top, as well as those seams where the boxes connect. After that dries, I'll go over it with some fine grit sandpaper. And I'm, of course, going to make sure my drawers fit in there. And I also found that it was easier to place the drawers in there before I put the handles on because not all of the drawers set the same way in the boxes. That way I can use my eye to try to make sure everything is level as well as a ruler to try to get those handles to go evenly across. Now I can remove those drawers after I remove all those little glue strands and I can paint this box with the same Waverly White chalk paint. I did not paint the inside of these inserts because I wanted it to have that natural wood color just like the outsides of the drawers, but I did paint the entire outside except for the top back part. We are going to be adding something to that. Now we can set that to the side for just a minute and use two of these Dollar Tree wood trays. And I am measuring the center side on the inside of each of these trays and making a line. So you'll find the center on each of the sides for both of the trays. And then using eight of the Dollar Tree wood cubes, we're going to make four sets of two by attaching two of those end to end with some Gorilla wood glue and hot glue. I did not use the tumbling tower pieces because they were too long to fit down evenly inside these trays. Now I can attach these to the inside of the tray right below the line that we just drew using the wood glue and hot glue. So each tray will have one on each side. And this is going to create a shelf in the middle of the tray. 
And if you're placing it right below the line that was already drawn, everything should be nice and level. Using some of these jumbo craft sticks from Walmart, I'm gonna cut the rounded end off of one side and then make my mark for the other side to determine how long I need that one to be. And then cut another one just like that so that we can cover the front part of these wood cubes up and it'll have a nice finished look when we're done with it. And I'm going to attach that again using the wood glue and hot glue. For the top and bottom of each one of these, I'm going to use some giant craft sticks. Again, these come from Walmart. And I'm going to cut the rounded tip off just like I did the other craft sticks and hold that in place to determine where I need to cut that down. And you can just use some plain scissors to cut those. So you'll want to create four of the same length so that you can place one on the top and one on the bottom of each of these shelves. And I'm gonna again use the wood glue and the hot glue. And I always like to try to make sure that mine is gonna fit before I glue anything down. And now you have this really cute shelf and you'll do that right on the bottom so it'll have a nice finished look so that when you're looking at this piece, you don't see those wood cubes at all. Doing that for both of those trays now I'm going to attach these side by side. Just try to make sure that everything stays lined up at the top and the bottom so that when you put this piece together, everything will sit flat and flush like it's supposed to. I didn't like the way the handles were showing at the top and the bottom of the trays. To cover that up, I'm using some of these jumbo craft sticks. And it will take three across the top for the width, so it'll really be two and a half. So I went ahead and cut three of those down to cover up that first top part of the tray. Then I can glue two of those down, and for the third one, I can hold that in place and make my mark underneath that with the pencil and then trim that excess off with my scissors. And then, of course, make sure that everything's going to line up before I glue that down with my hot glue. Then I will do the exact same thing on the top of the other tray and just try to make sure all those craft sticks line up. I cut eight of those Jumbo craft sticks to cover up the handle at the bottom because we're going to glue the bottom part to the other shelf. So you only have to cover up the top of the bottom of the handles and then flip it over and cover up the top, the bottom of the top of the shelf if that makes sense and you don't have to have all three craft sticks like we did at the top just two so that it will be nice and covered up using one of these rectangular wood plaques from walmart i believe they were less than a dollar remove that staple on the back and i'm using some of these quart paint stir sticks from lowe's to create the outside frame of our door. Now the middle piece sticks out a little bit further on this plaque than the front and back piece. So that is what I'm using as a guide to cut the top and bottom pieces of this paint stir stick. And then I hold it in place, make sure everything's gonna line up. And then I can glue that top and bottom piece down before I glue my sides down or take my measurements for my sides. And again, I'm using that outside center piece as the guide so everything will look nice and even when we put everything together. Then I'm gonna use that same method to measure those side pieces by going to the outside edges. And then I'll cut those two long side pieces down and glue those in place before we create our X for the middle of our barn door. To create the X in the middle, I'm gonna take one of those quart stir sticks and kind of just hold it from corner to corner and then use my pencil to kind of go by the lines on the outside frame so I'll know where to cut these. And I can just cut that with my scissors and if it doesn't fit perfectly, you can just go back and trim a little bit more off. But once you know everything's going to line up, you can glue that first piece down so you'll know where you want to place your second piece. And because I don't want them to kind of overlap, I want everything to be flush, I'm going to cut the outside corners first 
by using the same method I did for the first side, just using the pencils and kind of going by those outside edges. And then once everything lines up, I can draw the center section to be able to cut that out. And then I can glue those two pieces in after I make sure everything's gonna fit and line up. And again, I'm just using the hot glue to glue all of that down. Make sure you get all your glue strands off before you do any kind of painting. Using four of those Dollar Tree wood cubes, I'm gonna drill a hole completely through all four of these. And you wanna make sure it goes all the way through because this is how your door is gonna be able to move from side to side. So this is the top part of the shelf. We're gonna attach one of the wood cubes to the outside corner and make sure that your holes are going from side to side and then we can attach the other wood cube to the other corner. So you have the front of your shelf facing you and you're attaching your wood cubes in the very front where the opening is on your trays. To attach the cubes to the back of the door, I'm gonna hold the door to the front of the tray and make sure everything lines up so that I can mark where the next cube goes so I know that it won't go any further than that outside cube when we slide the door from left to right. And then once I have that marked, I'm just gonna use some hot glue to attach that right where we just drew. Again, making sure your holes are from side to side so when you put your rod in there, everything will slide back and forth. So now the door can't go any further than that outside cube. We're gonna do the exact same thing on the other side so that when everything gets together, your door will be able to move from left to right. Now we can paint it. I'm gonna paint this with the Waverly White chalk paint. This does take two coats. And I did paint the entire piece, front, back, sides, the door, the top of the tray, everything. I wanted to make sure everything was painted. Again, if you don't like distressing, you can skip over this part, but I did distress this with my gray chalk paint all the way around this piece, as well as those drawers and really emphasizing on those handles as well to kind of bring those handles out. Now we can attach everything together. We're gonna to attach the shelf to the top of the drawers. We're gonna make that flush to the back of the drawers. And I am attaching this with E6000 and hot glue because I've already painted the top part of those drawers. I didn't want to use the wood glue since it wasn't raw wood. Now to attach the door, we're going to use one of these um, garden stakes. It had a truck at the top of it that I've already used on another DIY. And I'm just holding it there with some pliers and kind of bending over exactly where I need it to be and then bend it back and forth and you do have to scrape a little bit of paint off to try to get most of that metal exposed and then I'm going to take my wire cutters and just wiggle back and forth back and forth until it comes apart. Now I'm going to paint that with the white chalk paint and I'm also using two wooden beads to fit on each end. And I just found it was easier if I just went ahead and put it on my metal rod there and painted them. And those are gonna be the end caps for our doors. Now I do recommend using a clear sealing wax because that's gonna help that door slide a lot easier from left to right. And I'm really making sure I put a good amount of wax right there at the top of the drawers as well as the top part between those wood cubes and then the entire front of the shelf where all that wood will rub back and forth together. It'll just help it glide better. And then underneath the wood cubes as well as the entire back part of the door. It's also gonna help your paint not chip off when you're moving the door back and forth. I also went ahead and dry brushed the gray chalk paint to distress the wood beads and the rod. And now we can place our door on there, slide the rod through all of those holes on the cubes, and then attach our wood beads on each end. And I'm just gonna put some hot glue on there and hold those in place. And now you have the cutest shelf that the door slides from left to right so you could decorate it however you want to. I love how this piece turned out. This 
is so beautiful. There are so many ways you could decorate this. I picked these up at Lowe's. You're going to need one pack of three, which is like 98 cent, and then one extra one. Using three of these same size signs from Dollar Tree. I'm going to begin by taking the painter sticks and I'm going to cross them over to make an X. So I'm just going to overlap one on the other. Use one of the signs and line it up with the outside corners of the painter sticks to the outside corner of the sign. Hold that as level as possible and then make a marking so I'll know how to cut my angles. Using my hand miter shears, they're a little bit difficult to use. I do have to score it a couple of times until I'm able to cut those in, um, cut those in pieces off. But it's probably because this wood is a little bit thicker and harder to cut than just regular soft wood. I cut those two angles and then held each one up to the other two to create the same angles at the bottom. Now I overlapped them again, held them in place where I wanted them to be, and made a marking so I'll know where to make my cuts because I want these X's to be flush rather than overlapping, so I'm going to cut that center piece out. I held that in place with a clamp so that I was able to take the other two and line them up with that X to try to get it as close as identical as possible, but it's not going to be identical once you cut those pieces off, um, but just try to get it as close as you can. Using the outside corners at the bottom of the top of the handle of the paint stick, I set the sign on there so that I could draw the line across there to make the angles for the top piece. And then I can cut those out with those handheld miter shears. And what I did for that is once I cut those two, I just held one with the same angle at the bottom on top of the other painter stick to draw my angles. So I cut the first two and then I used those to create the other two pieces. So you'll have two identical pieces for one side and two for the other that you're going to switch. I hope that makes sense. It's a little bit confusing. Then I just held the center part together with a clamp so I could make marks where they overlap. So when I cut the center section out of one of those paint sticks, I'll know exactly where to line each of those pieces up to glue them together so that they will be as close to the same as possible for each X. Now I can again take those miter shears and cut those center sections out. I have these miter shears listed in my Amazon store if you are interested in them. I think they were like $15, I'm not sure. They do come in handy on soft wood. They are just a lifesaver. Using some Gorilla Wood Glue, and I set this down on some wax paper so I didn't glue it to my table, I'm going to place some glue on the end and then line it up where I made those previous marks, and then I can cut the other section, that bottom section off, and glue it where I placed the marks at the bottom of that single paint stick. And then I can take my clamp and hold everything together until that wood glue sets up. And I'll do the exact same thing with the other X. And I let my glue set for quite a few hours just to make sure it was going to be nice and sturdy. And I did hold, hold it all together with clamps until all the glue set. So they are pretty sturdy. Again, I'm not going to set anything too heavy on this because there's no nails or anything holding it together. It's just the wood glue. I removed all of the hangers from the sign and tried to remove as much paper from the front as possible because it was overlapping. You could paint over top of that, but I felt like the, paint might, uh, the paper might just peel up. So I tried to remove as much as possible, and then I went over all of that with sandpaper to get it nice and smooth and get all of that extra paper off. I filled in the holes where the hangers were with some spackling. You could use wood filler, caulking, whatever you have on hand. 
While that's drying, I'm using the Waverly White chalk paint and gave each of these X's one coat all the way around all of the sides and two coats on each one of these signs on the entire sign, inside and out, and the top rim as well. So they're all gonna be covered with two coats of the Waverly White chalk paint. And of course, you're gonna allow all of that to dry before you assemble this together. I'm using some of the wood cubes from Dollar Tree. You get the package. It, it shows four here, but I do end up using 10. I don't know what I was thinking when I took four out, but you do use 10 and that is going to be the support to hold these signs together to make this tray. Taking one of the signs, I'm gonna hold it up to the bottom of one of the X's. Now it is gonna sit a little higher. It's not gonna be flush to the bottom of the actual paint sticks themselves. I just wanted to make sure that I have it as level as possible, the sign part, before I glue the wood cubes down. I just glued the wood cubes to the paint sticks. And once I have those in place, I can then glue the sign itself to the wood cubes and the paint stick. And try to hold it level so that when you add your other side, it'll be nice and level and not kind of leaning. Once I have the bottom sign in place, well, I'm gonna call them trays now. Once I have the bottom tray in place, I'm gonna do the exact same thing for the top. So the angles are not going to line up perfectly with the sign. So I just let them come up a little bit higher than that tray at the top. And I'm gonna do the exact same thing by gluing those wood cubes down and then gluing the sign, it's well, the tray itself to the wood cubes and the paint sticks. And I did the top and bottom first so that I could kind of measure the distance for the center one so I would have the same amount of distance between each one of these trays. And then I can place my wood cube right there once I determine the width that I need it to be between each one onto the paint stick again, then I can um, glue the tray itself to the X and the wood cube. Let all of that glue set up so your signs don't move around too much. And then you can add your other X to the trays on that side. And I did not measure it perfectly. My X's are not perfect, so I eyeballed them to try to make them as the tray parts as level as possible. And then I added the wood cubes just like I did on the other side. Each time I just kind of held it up, made sure the tray was exactly where I wanted it to be, to be level. Then I could add the cubes and then add the glue to the sign and the paint sticks. And I hope that made sense, you guys. Now this project is finished. I think it turned out gorgeous. Again, I wouldn't set anything too heavy on it, but I love the design. I love those X's on the outside. It's very unique, and I love how it turned out. Starting off with two of the wood palettes. Again, you could find in the Dollar Tree Plus section for $3 a piece. After removing the labels, I'm gonna remove the hangers. Now, the first set I pulled off, that staple went flying, so the second set I decided I would just cut that with my scissors before I accidentally hurt somebody or hurt myself with that staple going everywhere. I took some Gorilla Wood glue and applied it to the end so that I could push these together. And to give it a little bit added security on the back, I'm just using some pieces of scrap paint stick. These are the one gallon stir sticks, I believe. And I'm just going to use the Gorilla Wood glue to apply those in the seams to hold these two palettes together. Using two of the five gallon paint stir sticks, and these are from Lowe's because the ones at Walmart are thinner. The ones at Lowe's are actually the same depth as the back pieces of this palette. I'm gonna apply that with my wood glue and set it a little bit to the center, but more to the outside edge. And you'll see why later on in this project. 
let that glue set up, and then I can take my antique wax made by Waverly and go over this entire piece. So I did make sure that I got those palettes where you could see the back part of the sticks from the front, as well as the top and bottom edges. And I'm just taking a dry paper towel and smearing that in and lightening it up just a little bit. So when you use the wood glue or whatever type of glue you're using, just make sure that you have wiped any of the excess off before you use the wax because the wax will not stick to the glue and it will just leave it a little discolored. Now I made sure I painted the back, the sides, and everything because I like everything to have a nice finished look. I created a decal on my Cricut, and as always, if I am able to, I leave this as a free printable on my website, which is in my description box below. So I will have that there for you. All you have to do is go over there, print it out, and then you can trace this onto your project. If you are using the Cricut yourself, I use the fonts Ink Free for Is Better On Thee, and Hello Honey for Life and Porch. And Hello Honey is a free font that you can get from dafont.com. To apply a hanger to the back, I'm using some of Dollar Tree's nautical rope and some hot glue and applying it to the back piece of the palette. Now, I do not recommend you hang anything very heavy on this sign when you're finished with it. If you are going to do that, please make sure you use some E6000 just a more permanent, stronger glue to hold your hanger on. Using one of Dollar Tree's hooks, I'm not gonna use the hardware that it comes with because these screws are too long and they will go through the project. I'm gonna use some much shorter screws that I already had on hand. Now this is where those paint sticks come into play because I wanted to make sure that everything was lined up and even on the back and it didn't set down further because you have those two middle pieces in the back of the palette holding that together. I'm just pre-drilling a little pilot hole. I'm not going through the wood, just something so that I can start my screws when I apply this hook to the back of the sign. I made sure that I had just the hook showing so that only the hook will show from the front of the sign. And then I'm gonna secure those in place with my smaller screws that I already had on hand. Now you have a really cute, porch sign that you could hang anything you wanted to on. I think this is so adorable. At the Dollar Tree Plus section, found this for $5 and it is a very good size birdhouse. Using the antique wax, again made by Waverly, I'm very carefully going to paint the entire roof starting from the underside of each section of the roof. And again, wiping that off with a paper towel to lighten it up. You can make it as dark as you want it, but I kind of wanted everything to match. And I'm gonna go over just the entire roof as well as those underneath pieces and let that completely dry before I paint the birdhouse itself. And this is just gorgeous. I love the way that wood grain comes out. Taking a bamboo cutting board from Dollar Tree, we're going to attach the birdhouse to the, all the way to the back of the cutting board, and I'm just measuring to make sure I have equal distance on each side, and that is flush in the back. Then I can make my mark with my pencil so I will know exactly where to place this after I glue it down, or once I glue it down. Using some E6000, just because this cutting board you know, it has a little bit of a very smooth feel to it. It's not, you know, completely raw wood. I wanted to make sure that it would stay together, so I'm using the E6000 rather than wood glue. And then I'm also using some hot glue to hold it in place. Very carefully, I'm gonna give it two coats of my exterior white paint. Again, you will wanna make sure you put a protectant on this if you have it out in the weather. I'm gonna have mine on a covered porch, but you do want it to have that protective coating so that it will last for a very long time. Using this sign from Dollar Tree, I went over this with some sandpaper because it's not real wood and I wanted to make sure that my paint adheres to it very well. And this took, I think two coats and then so a few little spots took an extra coat just to cover up that dark green. Using another bamboo cutting board, 
We're gonna paint that in the same white color. And again, I painted all of these pieces, the entire pieces, except for that long sign. I didn't paint too much. I only put one coat on the ends because you're not gonna see those end pieces. I measured this to the center of the cutting board and made a mark with my pencil so I know exactly where to place this sign when I glue it down. And I did the exact same thing on the bottom part of the cutting board that has the birdhouse on it using the other end of the sign to make sure I could find the center. Now that I have my marks in place, I'm gonna set that all to the side and use four of the tumbling tower pieces and then two of those wood square pieces that you can get from Dollar Tree. I'm gonna glue two of the tumbling tower pieces end to end and another set of two in the exact same way. And then I can add my square pieces to the top and bottom of one end. And this is where the tumbling tower pieces are um, like they're standing up like a skinnier side. You'll see in just a minute what I'm talking about. We're creating some little flower boxes to go beside our birdhouse. And I'm just applying all of this together with some hot glue. And then you wanna make sure you wipe all of that glue off before you use your antique wax. Again, because that wax will not stick to the glue. So I created two of these so there would be two flower boxes that we can attach after they're dry right there on top of the cutting board, one on each side of the birdhouse. And then it just really brings out the roof color since this is the same color. And then I can glue those down in place using some hot glue. And then to give it a little bit of greenery, I'm gonna use some boxwood greenery from Walmart. And I'm clipping off just the top little pieces, like a little tiny piece of the branch, and I'm hot gluing that down until I get those flower boxes nice and full. And then add a little leaf here or there just to make sure they're nice and full on both sides. Once I have all of that done, we can assemble this piece and I'm gonna be using some E6000 again and some hot glue. So I'm putting a really, really good amount of that E6000 right in the center. And then I'll go around that with my hot glue. I try not to mix them together because they don't seem to work very well if you put the hot glue and the E6000 together. I'm gonna hold that up under the birdhouse, let the hot glue set up, which is just gonna take a minute or two, and then we can add the other cutting board to the bottom, which is now gonna be the base of our birdhouse. Of course, you're gonna to wanna to let your E6000 set up for several hours before you put this outside to make sure everything's nice and sturdy. To give it a little added extra cuteness, I'm gonna take one of these decorative wheelbarrows that you can find at Dollar Tree, and I'm just gonna set mine on the front but you could use a dab of E6000 to hold it in place. Creating a tray using this Easter sign from Dollar Tree. I just removed the rabbit and the hanger and then I'll try to remove as much paper as possible. This actually came up fairly easy. What I couldn't get off, I made sure that I sanded those edges so that it was nice and smooth. Although I'm gonna be covering it up, I wanna make sure there weren't any grooves or bumps to prevent my wood from sitting flat. I am using the one gallon paint stir sticks that you can pick up at Lowe's. They're 10 in a pack, so you will need at least two packs. I cut the end off of the handle and then I just took that piece and traced along 11 more pieces. So you will need 12 of these paint sticks to put on top of this sign. I'm securing it with hot glue and I'm starting on one side at the bottom in the corner. You will have some excess left over on the side, but we will take care of that in just a moment. I'll, I will attach each one of these pieces as close as possible to the next piece and try to keep it as straight until I get to the end of the sign. You will also have a little bit of excess at the end, but we're gonna cut all of that off and make sure everything is nice and flat and straight. After the glue sets, I just took a utility knife and cut the sign off of the edge and you do have to 
cut it quite a few times. Of course, my utility knife was probably dull. So I went through the back and cut that after I could bend it back a little bit. And then you'll cut the side off in the same way using the utility knife so that you get a nice straight edge and you have a nice straight edge on all four sides. I took some sandpaper and sanded all four sides of this to make sure everything was nice and smooth and straight. To create the sides for the tray, the two short ends you will be able to use just one of the paint sticks. So that is long enough to be able to cut the handle off. I believe it was like nine and a quarter inches. And of course I like to measure both ends because you never know if it's perfectly square or not. But in this case, they both were nine and a quarter inches. I cut that down with my handsaw, made sure I sanded the ends. Now this does have the ruler on the back side of it. So I am placing the ruler portion to the inside of the tray. I put hot glue at the bottom and then just held that up end to end on the sign until the glue sets up. And then I will repeat that on the opposite end for the short side. Then I can go in and add the two longer sides and make sure that I butt those up to the ends of the shorter sticks. Now on the longer sides, it will take two of the paint sticks because they're not long enough to go all the way across. So in order to kind of make it look even, I just took two and cut them so that they would meet in the middle. I believe it was about six and a half inches for each of those, so it was about 13 inches for the long piece. Again, made sure that I sanded everything down nice and smooth, and then I could apply my hot glue at the bottom as well as one of the ends to make sure that I can glue that to the end on the short side. Hold that in place and then I can go and add the other side in the same way. Then they'll meet right there in the middle in the front and then I can repeat this on the opposite side as well. Now this is going to be a beautiful serving tray. Of course it's not going to be sturdy enough to serve drinks on but I'll show you towards the end of this project what I mean by serving tray. I created the same stain mixture using the truffle paint and water and went over this entire piece. Well, all of the wood pieces. I didn't paint the bottom because it was already a brown color from the sign. But I also made sure that I went on the top edge of each of the sides of the tray and just tried to get a very nice even coat all the way around. After that dries, and it does take a little bit of time to dry because it's very watery, I'm going to take some of that same beautiful note card paper from Dollar General and cut this down to the width of the sides of the tray so that I can place these on the inside of the tray. I believe they were about three quarters of an inch wide and I tried to make sure that I was able to keep the design consistent going across so that each piece that butt up to the next one was cohesive all the way around. I applied it in the same manner I did with the coasters using Mod Podge on the actual wood and then applying the Mod Podge to the back of the paper and then seal that in. And I will repeat this around the entire inside of the sides of this tray. Just trying to make sure that I cut everything straight. And of course, that's why I'm using my Cricut paper cutter because I don't cut the straightest lines and this will provide me a nice straight line so everything butts up together. And then if a few little pieces are popping up, you add a little bit of Mod Podge, push them down and get a nice good seal behind the paper. And then you will have to cut the end piece to match and flush up with the corner. After all the paper is applied, I go over that to seal it in with the Mod Podge around the entire pieces of the paper, as well as I will complete the inside of this tray on the other three sides. Now you have a beautiful tray that you can serve snacks to your friends that coordinates beautifully with the coasters, and you can also use this in your decor all year long. 
using six of these square wood planks from Dollar Tree, take one of those and cut it directly in half so you have two even pieces. I'm gonna use hot glue at the bottom of one of the halves and apply that to the side of one of the wood planks. Now I'm using hot glue for video purposes. I do recommend you use wood glue to give you a really long-term sturdy hold. I added a bead of hot glue on the back side of that short half piece and applied the next square to that. So it looks like we're creating dividers. Repeat that with the second half, adding it to the sides of that square, and then we'll add one more square to the end. So you have three full-size squares and those two half pieces in the middle to create dividers. Once that third piece is in place, take another one of the squares and apply the glue at the bottom, and we're gonna add this to the end. So you'll have two full-size pieces on each end. And you do have to hold it in place for a little while to let that glue set up. Try to keep those end pieces as straight as possible, but if they lean, that's okay. We can fix that in just a little bit. Measuring from the outside ends, and I, mm, I can't remember, but I think it was about 14 inches. I am using the five gallon paint stir sticks from Walmart this time. I usually get mine at Lowe's, um, but I picked these up at Walmart. They don't have the rulers on the side, so that was perfect for this project, but they are a lot thinner than the ones you pick up at Lowe's. I am making markings on the side so that I know where to apply my glue. I don't want to go above those marks when I put my hot glue on because I'm going to stain this piece as well. Then I can attach that bottom piece and hold the outside edges as straight as possible to line everything up. Then I'm going to take the next piece and apply it to the top of the crate. So you're going to need six of those paint stir sticks for this project. I am applying the top piece so that when I add the middle piece, I can create equal distance between the two. And at this end, this is where you can hold that piece out and really make sure that you get it straight so everything's nice and square. Then I can add my center piece and try to keep it with equal distance. Otherwise, you could measure it, but it's such a tight fit. I mean, it's not a whole lot of distance between the two. So I just tried to eyeball it and make sure I had the same amount of distance between the top and the bottom. And you'll repeat this on the opposite side. And then you're going to have the cutest little cubby tray with these dividers in it. Once I get that last piece in place, I am going to stain this piece again using the same stain mixture that I used in the previous two projects, which is the truffle chalk paint made by Waverly mixed with water. Now I did put this one a little bit darker. I added a little bit more paint to it to bring out that wood grain effect. After it has completely dried, I am going to add a decal that I created on my Cricut to the front of this tray. And I did make sure I stained this entire piece, inside, outside, the bottom, the ends. I just like to have a very nice finished look. I have this as a free printable, this entire piece, because we're going to add the decal to each of the paint sticks on one side. I have this as a free printable on my website, which is in my description box below if you are interested. You could certainly print this out, trace it onto your project, and use a chalk marker or a white marker or anything to transfer this on. After the decals are added, this project is finished, and I thought this would be the cutest way to display your games. If you're having the girls over and you're playing game night, you can have something to keep your score, your coasters, your game set in, but it also is a beautiful decor piece. Trees Plastic Bins. This is already a beautiful dark gray, but I'm gonna use some Krylon Fusion spray paint in the color Hammered Silver. 
And I'm going to be painting this in this beautiful and very large spray tint that my husband gave me for Christmas. Um, this thing is absolutely amazing. It's so large you can put an actual piece of furniture in there. And I'll have this listed in my Amazon store if you are interested. Now I gave this one solid coat on the bottom and then I'm gonna flip that over once it's dry to the touch and give it one solid coat on the inside. This spray paint made this plastic bin look like a true piece of metal. It turned out absolutely beautiful. Now you can use this for many different ways. I'm gonna use it to store rolled hand towels and washcloths in, but I think it would be really pretty to also use it to store toilet paper rolls in. But you could also rustic this up a little bit if you wanted to, but I loved that hammered metal silver look. Dollar Tree's garden dishes that measures about 10 inches in diameter and two and a half inches deep. I'm going to give this two thin coats of ivory chalk paint on the front and back of this bowl. Once that dries, I'm going to take some antique wax and go over it to create a faux wood finish. So using a chip brush, I'm going to dab it into the antique wax and then go in circular motions around the outside of the bowl. So you want to go in one continuous stroke in the same direction, but I'm going in the circle so to create the faux wood grain. Then taking a dry paper towel, you can drag it very lightly across the antique wax and it's going to create depth and dimension in the color. Now you can remove as much wax as you like to make your bowl lighter. I, however, wanted mine to be darker, so I am going to repeat this two times to create a nice dark finish. You can also lightly drag your paper towel in wavy motions to create that wood effect. Allow that antique wax to thoroughly dry, then flip it over and repeat the same process on the inside of the bowl. I'm just going to take the brush and move it around in certain directions to create that faux look. Once your antique wax has completely dried, go over it with a clear sealing wax to seal that in and prevent that from chipping off of the plastic container. Using one of Dollar Tree's rounds that you can purchase in the Dollar Tree Plus section for $5, remove the sticker from the bottom and sand any of that excess glue off, as well as take your sandpaper around the outside edge because it's very rough to get that nice and smooth. Also using one of Dollar Tree's wooden pencil holders, I'm gonna sand that down because it is extremely rough and I wanna have a nice smooth finish. Then wipe all of the sanding dust off before taking some Gorilla Wood glue and attaching the bottom of the cup to the center of the bottom of the wood round. Now I'm just going to apply a generous amount and spread that out evenly and then attach it to the center and set something heavy on it and allow that glue to set up for several hours. I want to be able to use mine as a true cake stand and not just for decorative purposes. I'm going to be using some butcher block oil, which is food safe. Stir it before and during the application. Using a lint-free cloth, I'm going to apply this to the entire piece, including the inside of that cup because the wood was so dry. Now, as I'm applying this, it is going to bring out that beautiful wood grain finish. You can allow that to dry and add additional coats. Just read the label that the manufacturer recommends for drying time in between coats. Now, once mine has dried, this was such an easy project, but I love how it turned out. I love that true wood grain and the fact that it is food safe. In Dollar Tree's serving wear section, you can find these beautiful designed, very thick 
plastic bowls, as well as their glass bowls. These sell, I believe, either two or four for $1.25. I'm going to attach the bottom of the smaller bowl, the glass bowl, onto the bottom of the plastic bowl using E6000 and a couple of dots of hot glue. I'm going to go over this with some rubbing alcohol to remove any debris, glue strands, and fingerprints. Allow that to dry, and I'm going to give this two coats of Rust-Oleum's spray paint in the color Slate. This is a beautiful gray finish. I also made sure to paint the inside as well as the rims. Now I'm going to be using two different metallic paints. One of them is a metallic brushed silver, and the other one is a metallic gunmetal gray. I'm also using a chip brush so that I can blend the two together. I'm going to start off by applying the brushed silver and then go in and add the gunmetal gray. Then I could take that chip brush and blend the two paints together. I started on the bottom of the bowl because I've never tried this technique and I wasn't sure how it was going to turn out. But I am loving how this color is really coming out, especially that brushed silver. I continue to use that method around the base of the bottom of the bowl, applying the two different paints and then blending them in with the chip brush. Once that paint dried, I'm going to flip it over to the outside edge and take that brushed silver and go over each one of those lines to really bring those out as well as the bottom part of those lines where the grooves go down, I'm going to take the gunmetal gray and brush in between those and then take my chip brush and kind of blend in the middle. I still want those outside indentions to really stand out. It is really giving this a gorgeous finish. I did that around the entire outside of the bowl, the rim, and then for the inside, I did the blending method just like I did on the base. After that coat dries, I'm going to take some water and add it to the brushed silver metallic paint. Thoroughly stir that together and take a piece of sponge, dab it into the watered silver paint, dab most of it off onto a paper towel, and then I'm dabbing this into the inside just using a pouncing motion up and down to create an oxidized look. So the water mixture has a lot of bubbles in it and when you take that sponge and pounce it up and down onto your bowl, it leaves these tiny bubbles and then as they dry, it just gives it this beautiful oxidized look. And now it has a beautiful vintage look. I am extremely happy with how this project turned out. I'm using an 8 inch terracotta pot from Walmart that costs less than $4. I'm going to give this two coats of that slate gray spray paint and allow that to thoroughly dry. Don't forget about the top rim as well as somewhat down the inside of the top rim. I'm going to use some white acrylic paint, water that down a little bit, take a sponge, dab most of that paint off, and then again, pounce up and down all over the entire outside rim, as well as some of the inside of this terracotta pot. Allow that to completely dry before you move on to the next step of paint. I'm going to add a little bit of black paint. Mine's actually black chalk paint, but you can add black acrylic paint. Mix that up to a nice, beautiful, lighter gray color than the slate, which is the base, and then pounce that up and down in various areas all over the pot. It creates a beautiful cement, almost granite-like color. Okay, so now that we have our pot ready, my husband was kind enough to cut me this branch off, which is about four feet tall. I have placed some duct tape on the bottom of the pot just in case because it has a hole and that's where I'm going to be placing the branch, but I want to make sure that it does not come through the bottom. We're going to be using this spray foam. You can find this at Lowe's for less than $4 a can. So we're going to have to do this in sections at a time. So my idea is to place the branch 
directly into the hole and hold it as straight as possible as I spray the foam down inside of the pot. Okay, it's still setting up. So a couple of things that I would recommend if you recreate this project is make sure you have something, two heavy objects to put on each side to hold the branch in place because it takes a little while for that foam to set up. And also you can mist water on it to help speed the cure up. It's gonna take quite a while for this to cure. Okay, so it's been about 15 minutes and as you can see, it is standing up on its own. It's not completely set. I've put way too much foam in there because it is expanding. So I would recommend that you would put maybe half and allow that to expand. I am gonna have to trim this off with a putty knife to get it kind of even so that I can put my moss down on top. But I do also recommend that you wear gloves because this is very sticky. When I cleaned my mess up, it's very hard to get off your hands and make sure you wear some eye protection. Now that I've trimmed some of that excess off at the top of the pot, using some hot glue and some green moss, I'm going to apply this to the top as well as the bottom part of that branch. Now that moss was extremely too bright green for me, so I decided to go over top of that with some Spanish moss, and I think that blends in a lot better. Using some of these olive branch picks from Walmart, they sell for $3 a piece, I'm gonna use three of these and cut each of those limbs or stems off of this bundle down into individual pieces. Using a drill, I'm gonna drill a couple of holes and start at the top and then hot glue some of the smaller pieces in at the top. And then the larger pieces, I'm going to place at the bottom and then fill them in as they go up. I did end up cutting the branch down and then re-drilling holes and reapplying the olive branches. Now it looks so much better. I love how this project turned out and I hope you guys like it too. Using two of these wire baskets from Dollar Tree, they measure three inches by eight and three quarters of an inch by two inch. After I remove the tag, I am gonna use matte black spray paint made by Krylon. Take these outside and give them one good coat all the way around. I am also using two of these glass jars that look like milk jugs from Dollar Tree and some black chalk paint. I get my black chalk paint from Dollar General. I love this stuff. I'm gonna go over the design in the very front with the circle and the wording as well as the top and bottom rim for both of these jars. I'm going to allow that paint to dry thoroughly, and then I'm going to take some white chalk paint, which is the Folk Art White Adirondack, and I'm gonna go over this entire jar completely with two coats, allowing it to dry in between coats. I also paint the top rim as well as down inside of the rim a little bit and the bottom. And I'm gonna do that for both of these jars. Now, once they're dry, this is how it looks. You can still see the design, but I wanna bring that out. And I started off with my sanding sponge. It's a very fine grit, and it was not bringing the design out as much as I wanted it to. So I took a 150 grit sandpaper, and I'm gonna go over this design very carefully and bring out the wording and the circles. And then I'm also gonna go over the top rim as well. It's just gonna bring that black chalk paint out. So we're just removing that layer of white chalk paint to reveal the black layer. And I'm gonna do the exact same thing for both of these jars and they turn out so gorgeous. I am in love with how these turned out. I'm gonna use some twine and wrap this around underneath the top rim a few times, and I'll take this jar and then set it down inside of the basket. So it's gonna rest at the bottom of the basket, and then I'm gonna hold my finger in place where the twine is in the front, and I'm gonna take one end feed it underneath the rim of the jar through the back around the center part of the basket and then feed it back through 
to come underneath the rim on the opposite side of the jar. Once I have that in place, I'm gonna hold it again in the front and I'll take the opposite end. So it's gonna wrap right around that center piece in the back, take the opposite end, pull that through just like I did the other side, wrap it around that center piece in the back, feed it through and make sure it stays underneath the rim of the jar. Once I have both ends in the front, I'm going to tie that very tightly, and then I'm just gonna make a simple shoestring bow. And then once I have my bow made, I can adjust the length of the bow at the top and make sure everything's nice and tight. And then I can trim off the excess twine. I'm going to take that excess twine and create a hanger at the top of the basket. On the backhand side, of the two outer wires. I'm gonna double knot this on each side, pull it really tightly, and I'm pulling it tightly as I go. Then I can trim that excess off at the hanger. And I'm gonna do the exact same thing for the other basket and jar. So you've got a nice hanger at the top, and then this is how it's attached on the back. And these turned out so beautiful. I just put a few florals in there. I love how this project turned out and I hope you guys like it too. Vinyl placemat at Dollar Tree. They also had a trivet with the same design. It's so pretty. I'm using some double-sided sticky tape and I'm going to apply that to all four of the edges of the back of this placemat. I am not using hot glue because hot glue under these type of placemats um, tend to bubble up or show. You can see the glue from the top part of it. So that's why I'm using double-sided sticky tape. So once I have that in place, I can then just peel um, all of the paper off of the tape. Then I'm going to set that to the side for a minute. I'm actually going to be attaching this to a cake board. I bought this in a package from Walmart. They're pretty large size cake boards. I'm going to place it on the shiny side because I wanted that cardboard backing to be the back of our sign. For the frame, I am using five gallon paint stir sticks. They come in a package of three, but you will need four of these. I'm gonna hold them up in place to determine where I need to make my markings for my cuts. And I am trying to line it up where the checks are the same color on each side. I started off by trying to make the cuts with these miter shears, which it did work, but it was a lot of effort to do so, so that I found that it was easier just to use my handheld miter box saw. Once I had those two links determined for the outside and top, I just used those as a guide to cut the other two pieces. I sanded all the edges down with some sandpaper, and then I'm going to go over each one of these with antique wax made by Waverly, and I do make sure I get those sides and ends. Once I have that applied on there, I'll take a dry paper towel, blend it in, and wipe the excess off. I'm gonna do that for all four pieces. Set those to the side and let them dry. Once they're dry, I'm going to attach it to the sign using Gorilla Glue, and I'm gonna place a nice even amount across the bottom, lining it up with the pattern that's on that buffalo check. Then I'm gonna place a clamp on each end, as well as in the middle, to hold that in place until the glue sets up. If there's any excess glue, I'll just take a paper towel and it wipes right off of that placemat. I'm doing the opposite end of that as well so that I will know exactly where to line up my side pieces. So I'm going to attach the other two pieces exactly the same way and make sure that I add clips to all of them. So when I get done, I'm actually going to make sure I have clips on all of the edges where the um, edges meet as well as in the middle and I'm trying to make sure I have equal pressure going across so everything will glue very nicely. So I let that sit for a few hours. Then once the glue set, I can remove all of the clips and I'm going to flip it over and to give it a little bit more sturdiness, I'm going to take a regular popsicle stick and cut that down into four pieces so that I can use hot glue to glue these 
right where the seams of each of those paint stir sticks meet. It's just going to make it a little bit stronger. To create a hanger on the back, I'm going to take a piece of twine as well as two pieces of ribbon, and I'm going to hot glue the ribbon over the twine, let that glue cool and set, and then pull the twine as tight as I can without pulling it loose from the glue, and then I can glue the other end down so I can have a nice tight hanger on the back. Then I'm going to flip it over, and it's gorgeous just the way it is, but I'm going to add a little greenery to it. So I'm using some boxwood greenery, and I have pulled them off the stem, and I am clipping off the big pieces at the end. I'm going to use that double-sided sticky tape again to attach these to form a wreath around the circle. So I'm going to apply the sticky tape to the stem at the bottom. Don't peel the top piece of the tape off yet. Line up my next piece tape that stem down, then I can go back and peel the paper off and push that piece of greenery down onto the sticky tape so that it lines up and blends in. So I didn't use hot glue because I didn't think that the hot glue would really hold on this placemat, so that's why I'm using the double-sided sticky tape. I'm going to repeat this process all the way around where I am taping the stem down then going back and overlapping it onto the previous stem. And I'll just continue to do this until I get back to where I originally started. Once I have all that in place, this sign is finished. It is gorgeous. I love the colors in it. I love how it turned out. And it is absolutely stunning with our previous project. I think this is a beautiful set. You guys let me know what you think. These 14 inch wire wreath forms as well as some burlap ribbon. I think this ribbon came from Dollar General. I'm going to flip it over to the back side, use hot glue so that I can hot glue the ribbon to itself and I'm using that little spatula tool to keep from burning myself. Let that glue cool so you have a, a nice strong hold and then I'm going to start wrapping it around the first part that I looped around about halfway line it up and get a good tight pull on this as you are wrapping it around the wreath form. We're going to do this for the entire wreath form. If you run out of ribbon like I did, just glue it to itself just like you did in the beginning on the back side of the wreath form. Cut the excess off and then start your new roll where you cut your first roll off at. And you want to do this on the back side so that you won't be able to see this when you hang your wreath up. Once I have everything nice and wrapped and the glue has cooled, now I can attach my florals. I am using this beautiful wisteria from Walmart. These are about $6 for one bundle. I'm using two bundles. Now I know that Dollar Tree sells wisteria, but it only has like one long stem on it, so it would take several of those to make this wreath. I cut all of the greenery off and then I'm applying the stem into the burlap and attaching it with some hot glue and then taking hot glue and gluing the very end leaf piece down but allowing the other pieces of the greenery to flow. I'm going to continue to do that around the entire outside of the wreath form and then come back in with the other greenery on the other bundle and then kind of fill it in on the inside of the wreath form until I get all the way around and it's really pretty and full. Then I can start attaching the flowers. So I'm cutting off each of the stems. So I started off with the two largest stems from each bundle so that I can attach the stem inside the burlap. I'll use a little bit of hot glue. Then I'm gonna use some floral wire to attach the middle and then the end piece. So I did the two longest ones opposite of each other so they'd be nice and full on opposite sides of the wreath. So I'm tucking that end piece into the burlap, I'm hot gluing it. Then I'll take a piece of floral wire after I pull the greenery up in between the flowers to get it nice and full. I'll take that floral wire and bend it over so it creates a loop on one end and then feed that down in between the stem of the florals through the burlap 
and then pull both of those pieces to the back side and then I'll twist it really tightly, cut off the excess floral wire and then I'm gonna tuck that down very carefully so you don't poke yourself into the burlap so it does not scratch your door or surface or wherever you're gonna hang it from. Then I can repeat that on the end piece of that long one and then I can take these shorter stems and continue to go around and fill this wreath in repeating that same process with the hot glue and the floral wire and as I'm going I make sure that I am pulling that greenery up in between the white flowers so everything blends in really nicely you'll continue to do that until it's nice and full and fluff everything out and then this wreath is finished and I love how it turned out. It is so pretty. Six by eight inch canvas frames. I'm going to remove the canvas by using my arrow staple remover. This thing is a lifesaver. It makes removing these staples so easy. I have this listed in my Amazon store in my description box. If you are interested, you just slide it right under those staples and it pulls them right out. Once I have that canvas removed, I will save the canvas maybe for a project later on. I only need the frames and I'm gonna do this for four of the canvases. I do hold them all up together to make sure they are very close to the same size. They're not gonna be the perfect same size. Taking the smallest one out of the four, I'm going to flip this over where those holes where the staples are are now facing me and I am using these ruler sticks from Lowe's. You can get a pack of 10 for $1 and I am going to make my mark across the top of the canvas and then use my handheld miter shears to cut that down. I also have that listed in my Amazon store if you are interested. So it's going to take five of these ruler sticks to cover the top and it will be some space in between them. I'm using some wood glue to attach the ruler stick to the top of the canvas where the whole parts are, where the staples were. And I like to start on the two outer pieces and then I can leave the same amount of distance in the pieces in between. So I'm using some Dollar Tree clamps to hold that in place and then wiping the excess glue off. I'll do that on the other side the exact same way and then I will repeat this process for each one of these sticks in between. So once I kind of know exactly where I want them to be and the spacing is pretty much the same all throughout, I can glue each one of these down, place the clamps on them, and if I have any excess glue, I will take a paper towel and wipe that off because I am gonna be staining my piece, so I wanna make sure that that glue is removed. I'm gonna take the other three frames. Now the two outside pieces, I am facing the staple holes to the inside, and then the other piece, the staple holes will be to the outside. So this is how I'm going to attach them together, the two longer pieces to the ends of the other piece, if that makes sense, you can kind of see what I'm talking about because it sounds a little confusing. I'm gonna attach those using wood glue, just put it up to the other end. Again, the staple holes on the left-hand side, they are facing inward, and then the staple holes on the other one are facing me. And this is gonna make more sense as to why I'm doing that in just a minute. So I'm gonna place some clamps on there, hold it in place, make sure everything is flush and even, and then I can do the exact same thing on the other side by adding the wood glue and the clamps. So now this becomes, those two longer ones are gonna be the legs of our shelf, and that top piece will be the top part of the shelf. Now that the wood glue has dried on this piece, this is going to be the second part of the shelf. So what we're looking at here is I'm just gonna place that and eyeball it to determine how high I want that to be up on the legs of the shelf. And then I will make a mark on the inside corner of each one of these pieces so I will know exactly where to attach it. So once I get that in there, I'm just gonna take some hot glue to hold it temporarily in place so that I can do a more permanent fix to it. So this is just gonna hold it there until that glue sets so that I am able to get all four of those sides glued together. Then I'm gonna pre-drill it 
with a very small drill bit so I can place a finish nail in there because I know that that hot glue is not going to hold it permanently so this nail is going to give it that permanent hold and I'm going to do that for all four corners by pre-drilling and then adding my finish nail. So all four sides will have those finish nails. That is the bottom shelf. And now we can work on the top shelf. So I can remove all those clamps, take those same painter sticks, now, or ruler sticks. These I want to have a little bit of an overhang on each end, as well as the front and back. So I held that in place, made my marking, cut it down with my miter shears, and then I'll use that first one as a template to cut five additional ruler sticks. So it'll be a total of six on the top because we're gonna place those very close together. We're not gonna have any spacing in those. I want to apply wood glue all to the top and take each of those six ruler sticks, place them on the top, and the wood glue is gonna give you a little bit of time if you need to move anything around, but make sure it's nice and straight and you have an equal distance of overhang on each of the sides. And then once it gets tacky enough, I'll flip that over and I know it's gonna need some additional support in the middle. So I'm using a scrap piece of canvas frame that I already had in my stash. I cut it down to size and then I am using the wood glue on each end and all across one side to glue that in place and then set something heavy on it. And I actually just let mine set overnight. Once that wood glue dries, I can then take some sandpaper and sand down any rough edges or any excess glue that I may have missed and didn't wipe off because I am gonna be staining my piece. Now I'm staining it with Minwax in the color Classic Oak, but you could paint this, stain it whatever color you like. I just love this subtle hint of stain and it really brings out that wood grain texture. I'm gonna go over this entire piece, making sure that everything gets one coat of this stain. And it also has a polyurethane in it, so it's gonna protect this wood. I allowed it to dry overnight, and now you can style it however you want. I absolutely love how this piece turned out, and you can use it for so many different things. You could actually set this next to your kitchen sink and put dish soap, sponges, so you guys, let's get started on our clock project using two of these signs from Dollar Tree. We're gonna remove the tags as well as the hangers and sand everything down nice and smooth. I also sanded the sides because they were a little rough. Then I'm gonna flip them over and use my square so that I can attach the two pieces together using some regular craft sticks. I'm going to attach one at the top and one at the bottom right where the two sides meet, but you want to leave a space right in the middle so that you'll be able to put your clock mechanism. This is just to hold everything together and square as we create our frame for the outside. I'm taking the side measurements, which end up being 14 inches on each side, and I'm using some of these paint star sticks from Walmart that come three in a pack for 97 cents. I will mark the measurements for my side pieces and use my hand saw to cut those down. Also make sure that you sand it so everything's nice and smooth. Now we can attach our side pieces to the sign, making sure that we line everything up to the outside edge. And I am attaching this with some E6000 as well as some hot glue. That hot glue is gonna hold it in place until that E6000 sets up and that's gonna be your more permanent hold. I'll flip it around and use the same glue to attach the other side piece. Once those pieces are in place, I can take the measurements for my top and bottom, which end up being 15 inches. And I will cut those down and glue those in place as well. Now I can take my measurement for my center piece that's gonna hold those two sides together in the seam, but also create the design for the frame for the clock. That was 11 and 1 8 of an inch. After I attach that, I'm gonna find the center on the sides as well as in the middle so that when I measure and cut my pieces down for the two center pieces, which happen to be six and three quarters of an inch, I will know exactly where to line those up so everything's nice, centered, and even. I'm using some of these Paint star sticks, they are the 
12 inch ruler sticks that you can find at Lowe's, 10 in a pack for a dollar. I'm holding that up at an angle and just marking out where I need to make my cuts for the corners. And then I'm using my handheld miter shears, which you can find linked in my Amazon store below if you are interested, to cut those down. And then if I need to trim anything up, I can go back, trim that up, and make sure it is a nice snug fit. And I will cut four pieces for all of those four corners. Once I know that everything's going to fit properly, I can then attach that using my E6000 and hot glue. Push everything into place nice and firmly. And because I like a very finished look, I'm going to use some wood filler to fill in any gaps or large spaces that I have. And let that dry. And then I can go over that with some sandpaper. And I'm just using some fine grit sandpaper to make sure I get everything very smooth and even. Then I can take my measurement for the center so that I can drill a hole. And I'm gonna make sure that I prop my piece up on some blocks so I don't drill through my table. And you wanna make sure that you have the diameter of the piece that you're gonna be using for your clock mechanism. Now I found this clock mechanism at Walmart for $4.97. The hands are way too small for the design that I need, but I do have an old clock that the mechanism did not work, but I took the hands off of. Now, of course, these are gonna be way too large, so I need to cut those down. So if you have an old clock, you wouldn't even have to buy this. You could use the mechanism out of that. But because mine didn't work, I did have to purchase that for $5 at Walmart. I just held one of the pieces up to the other to kind of draw the design out. And then I used a pair of scissors and very, very carefully cut this out because it is metal and you don't want to cut yourself. Then I held that piece up to the smaller one to try to get a similar shape so that I could trace and cut that out as well. And once I had it looking exactly the way I wanted it to be, I could set that to the side for right now. I'm using these three brass wreath rings that you can find at Dollar Tree. I only need the two largest pieces. I am going to be spray painting this as well as the clock hands using my Krylon Fusion All-in-One in the color matte black. I gave each side a coat to make sure that all of the color was consistent and you couldn't see any of the brass or the gold from the clock hands. Now, if you cannot find these brass rings at Dollar Tree, another alternative is to use this 14-inch wreath ring form and use the inner one as well as the third one and cut that off with your wire cutters and they will be a very similar size as the brass rings they won't be exact i'm using seven of the tumbling tower pieces as well as some wood glue and hot glue and i'm going to glue these end to end and i'm using my straight edge to make sure everything stays lined up and straight and i'm going to create two of these so you're going to need two rows of seven and I made sure that I wiped any of the excess glue off. I am also going to take nine of the tumbling tower pieces and do the same thing and create two rows of nine. So you'll have two rows of seven and two rows of nine. This is gonna become the back part of the frame. So because I need to put this on the back side, I'm gonna take my box cutter and cut the end pieces of those craft sticks off so that I can attach this to the back of the sign. This is gonna give it more of a very completed look. And you could definitely use some E6000. I don't, I think I just grabbed my wood glue because it was right there, but you would probably be better to use E6000. The wood glue worked perfectly fine for me, but again, you know, whichever your preference is. I'm going to attach the top and bottom and they're not gonna fit exactly. I will have to go in and use my miter shears to cut some of the pieces off. So for the end piece, which was the seven blocks, I did have to trim a tiny amount off to be able to fit that in and then attach that with the glue. And because I used the nine pieces at the top and the bottom, when you flip that around, you're gonna have a little bit of a space on the bottom two corners. And I just took an extra tumbling tower piece, cut those down to size and glued those in place just using hot glue. Then I can attach my final piece. 
Not only is this going to create a beautiful frame, it is also going to give you some depth so that when you put your clock mechanism on the back, it will rest evenly on the wall. Again, because I like a finished look, I'm using some spackling to fill in the cracks on all of those tumbling tower pieces. Let that dry, and then again, take some fine grit sandpaper and sand that down nice and smooth. And I did that for all four sides. Now you could certainly paint it any color you wanna paint it. I'm gonna paint it using some Waverly White chalk paint. And I like to start in the corners and get all of those fine lines first, and then I can come in and paint some of the larger sections. This did take two coats, and I painted this entire piece, including those outside edges, as well as the back part of the tumbling tower pieces, just in case you could see those. Now I am gonna give mine a distressed look using my favorite gray chalk paint, which you can purchase at Hobby Lobby, and I also have that listed in my Amazon store. And once I get that to my desired look, I can then add my largest ring to the base of the clock. And I'm going to attach this using some E6000. And I only attached it in four spots where they're all raised. And I put a bead of the E6000, or a nice little strip of that, pressed it down in the glue, and then I wiped that excess off. You wanna make sure you let that E6000 set up really good before you move on to adding anything else. So I do add the outside circle piece as well as the inside with the same method. And I did measure to make sure I had the same distance all the way around. And then you wanna set something on there and completely let that dry. Now it held up really, really well and I did let mine dry overnight. I'm using some of the metal numbers from Dollar Tree. Now I'm only gonna use the 12, the three, the six, and the nine, and so I only needed one pack. But if you wanna put all of the numbers on there, you need four packs. To give it a little bit of a rust look, I'm using some truffle chalk paint, and I am dry brushing around the edges of all of the numbers. You could completely skip this part, but I thought it would give it a nice rustic look. And once that dries, I can attach my numbers onto the metal part of the frame. I'm going to use E6000 to attach these on the top and bottom portion of the metal rings and let that set up. Now, for the three and the nine, you could put those sideways so that the top and bottom touch the metal rings but I didn't particularly like that. I want mine going up and down. And since I'm going to put them up and down, they're not gonna sit as high as the 12 and the six. To, so to fix that, I'm gonna use pieces of a regular popsicle stick and cut several tiny pieces down and then attach that to the back of the numbers using some hot glue so that I'll be able to raise that up. To disguise it a little bit, just in case you could see parts of that from the side view, I will paint those in the white chalk paint. And I'm gonna do the exact same thing for the number nine. After all of that paint dries, I can then attach these to the base of the clock using E6000. Again, you will wanna make sure that you let your glue set up so that your numbers don't move around. Now, I am completely happy with just having the 12, the 3, the 6, and the 9, but another option instead of adding all the numbers is you could cut down some of the smaller popsicle sticks to the length of the width between the two rings, and you could paint those and add those in for the numbers. That is just an extra option. Now it is time to add my clock mechanism and my hands this is how they look after they have been painted, and mine just snapped together. And because my mechanism center is not the correct depth of my sign, I am going to have to use some hot glue to attach this to the back because I won't be able to put that nut on there that they typically have and that's what holds it in place. So that is why I'm using the hot glue. But if you have a different mechanism, yours, you should, probably should not have to use the hot glue. So I could put that rubber washer on there, add my hands, 
and then put that tiny centerpiece that holds it all together. And I thought that my hands were just a little too dark. And to kind of blend that in with the clock, I went over those with the truffle chalk paint. And now I can add my battery and set the time. And I have a functioning clock. And I think it turned out really beautiful. This sign right here from Dollar Tree is simply gorgeous. So we are not gonna mess with this side. This can be a two-sided sign if you want it to be. We're actually just gonna use the back part of it. Removing the hanger as well as those staples and then sanding those holes down nice and smooth, I'm gonna give this one base coat of white chalk paint. I'm also going to be using some jumbo craft sticks and I'm gonna cut these sticks down to five and three quarters of an inch, which is the width of our sign up the top. And I'm using my handheld miter shears, which I have that linked in my Amazon store if you are interested. I sanded those ends down. And now that the white paint has dried, I'm gonna go over this with some Waverly Antique Wax. I'm applying it with a soft brush and then taking a dry paper towel and just kind of smearing it and going in one direction. So I'm trying to create the wood grain effect and I'm gonna do this in sections at a time so that the wax does not dry before I go in with my paper towel and kind of make those streaks to make it look like wood. Now you may be wondering, why didn't I just apply the wax directly to the back of this board? Um, instead, I painted it white first. Well, I wanted those light undertones to give it more of a wood, realistic wood look. If you paint or put that wax just on the back of that cardboard type stuff, it just simply looks like brown. So you need that light coat to give it more of a dimension and to make it look more real. I'm also going to use that antique wax on the craft sticks with the same process by applying it and then wiping it off. Now make sure you get all of your outside edges of the craft sticks because you will be able to see those. And you're going to let all of that dry before you apply the craft sticks to the side. So I'm going to adhere these with hot glue about a half of an inch off of each end. And this is gonna give it that nice wood look on the edging, like a little banding on the end. And to give it a little bit of like a nail head look, I'm using some of these pop stickers from Dollar Tree. And I'm gonna give four of those two coats of paint, make sure they're completely dried. And then I'm gonna place one at the top and bottom of each of our craft sticks using a little dot of hot glue. Not only do they look like nail heads, but it also brings those craft sticks out and really gives our sign some dimension. Now I found these letters at Hobby Lobby and I wanna say they were about a dollar and 70 cent a piece. I know you could find some of the MDF pieces at Walmart, but I couldn't find the lettering at my Walmart, so I did get these at Hobby Lobby. And I'm securing them down with some E6000 because it gives me a little bit of time to move my lettering around to line it up, but I also know it's going to give it that nice permanent hold. Again, I'm going to use another command strip to place right there between the two lettering so that we'll have a place for our wreath. And I just held the wreath up in place to make sure that I knew exactly where to put that command strip and then hold it in place. Now, I forgot all about this, so I recommend that you take a clear sealant. I'm using some clear sealing wax to go over this antique wax. It would be great if I had done that before I put the lettering on, but I completely forgot about it. So I'm doing it now just to make sure that wax and that paint don't chip off and that it'll last a really long time. Now you have a two-sided sign. Not only can you use one side for all the seasons, but if you wanna flip it over and use it in the fall with that gorgeous truck on the other side. Using three of these Dollar Tree signs, they measure six and a half inches by six and a half inches. Now, because I'm making a pair, I'm actually going to be using six of these, but I'm going to show you how to make one. After removing the backing, I'm going to give each one of these frames at least two coats of white chalk paint. Some of them will take three coats, and I did make sure to paint the backside as well. 
Set one of the frames off to the side. We're going to be using two of them. Well, actually be four if you're making a pair. And using some of these quart paint sticks from Lowe's, you get 30 in a pack for a dollar. To create a pair, we're going to be using 24 of these. I'm going to cut the rounded end off with my handheld miter shears. You can find this in my Amazon store in the link in my description box below if you are interested in those. Set it inside the groove of the backing of the frame. Make a mark to know where to cut so everything will sit and rest inside the frame. So you'll need six for each frame, which is a total of 24. For the other two additional frames that will be the centerpieces, we are using this corrugated metal sign from Dollar Tree, so you'll need two of these. And I'm going to hold that inside the grooves so that I can cut the side down that has the hanger on. I'm going to make a mark using a Sharpie so that it will rest inside of the frame at the top and at the bottom, and then I'll connect those two lines. Of course, I just grabbed whatever was closest to me, which happened to be a level. To cut this, I'm using some tin snips, so you want to make sure that you are very, very careful to not cut yourself because this tin is very sharp. Once you cut it, the edges will be extremely sharp. So you may want to wear gloves um, and probably maybe even some eye protection if you're trimming some very small pieces off. I found that it was easier to cut up the line until my tin snips couldn't reach anymore and then come in from the side and cut that down and continue until I get to the end. Now for the bottom part, we're going to do the exact same thing by lining it up inside of the grooves of the frame, making our markings, drawing our line, and then cutting that down, making sure that everything will fit inside of the frame so that we can put the backing back on. Now before we put the backing on, I'm using some of this scrap wood that I had. It measures about an inch wide and it's about a quarter inch deep. I am going to hold this under the frame so the front part of the frame is resting on the wood and then I'm going to draw my angles out from each corner so I have the wood lined up from one corner to the other I'll draw those angles out and then I'm using my handheld miter box and saw which mine by the way is so old and rusty I think I need to purchase a new one because it's getting quite dull um, I'm going to go through and cut all of those angles out for that piece of wood once I have those cut down, I'm going to put this back inside of the frame to make sure that it sits inside of it. So it's not sitting in the part that's resting where the back, um, the back goes back into it. It's actually fitting inside of the frame. So once I know that's going to fit, I'm going to take the same wood, hold it underneath and go from the other corners make those markings as well as the marking in the middle because we're going to cut this into two separate pieces so that when we put our x back into our frame everything will sit flush with the wood piece that's already in there again i'm going to cut all of these down with my handsaw and place them inside of the frame to make sure everything's going to line up and that everything is going to fit perfectly Again, because I'm making a pair, I am going to create two of these. So once I have both of those cut down, I'm going to take a piece of sandpaper to sand all those rough edges out from all the end pieces that I have just cut. And then I'm going to create a stain. I'm using antique wax and I'm going to mix some water. So it's about a 1-1 ratio of water to wax. And I'm going to shake that very thoroughly and it's just going to give us like a very light watery thin type stain. I'm using a lint free cloth to go over each one of our paint sticks that we have cut down. I'm doing the front and the sides as well as the other wood pieces that we cut out. Again make sure you get those sides because you will be able to see those. So as they're drying we're going to take the picture frames and we're going to use a foam brush and the same water antique wax mixture and we're going to apply these to the frames. So originally I was going to use a chip brush but I decided not to because the foam brush was giving me the effect that I was really going for. So you're just going to take a layer of that water mixture and go around the entire frame especially on those inside 
edges because you will be able to see that once the project is complete. I only had to put one layer on and it does take a little while to dry because it is watered down. So just be careful and be patient and allow them to thoroughly dry before you handle them. Now here, mine have already dried and I'm gonna use some clear Gorilla Glue. Now the manufacturer recommends that you dampen the area before you apply the glue. So I'm using a wet paper towel and dampening the side of the frame then applying the Gorilla Glue, and I'm gonna add just a couple of dots of hot glue to temporarily hold that in place so that I can add the frame at the other side. So once I have these two added together, I'm going to place some clamps on there and make sure everything stays flat and even, and then I'll add the third frame to the other side. So this is gonna create two of our shutters, so each one will have three frames. I'm going to place those clamps on there and allow that Gorilla Glue to thoroughly set up. So I let mine set up for several hours. While that's setting, I'm going to focus on the backs of the frames. Now this is not completely necessary, but since the paper doesn't peel off and the wording is um, a little bright, I wanted to take some regular copy paper and cover up that wording just in case you could see through it. So you only need to do this for four of the frames because the one in the middle will be completely covered, but the one with the paint sticks, you may be able to see between those paint sticks because we're not going to be gluing those down. So once I have all of that in place, my glue has now set on my frames, I wanted to add a little bit more stability to the back. So I'm going to use my staple gun and staple the seams between the three frames. I just added a couple in between each of the frames. Now we can take our paint sticks and apply those in the top and bottom frame. I'm not attaching them with glue. The backing will hold that in there, but that's why we covered the backing up in case you could see in between the paint sticks because they're not perfectly straight. In the middle one, we'll place our corrugated metal piece, put our backing back on, and then we can flip this over and add our wood X piece right across the metal piece. Again, I'm gonna make sure everything sits in there flush before I attach it, and I'm gonna just add some hot glue to the bottom edge of each of the corner pieces, and then glue that down to the sides of the frame. So as you're pushing that down, if you get a little bit of glue that comes out, make sure you go ahead and wipe that off. Then we'll do the exact same thing for the other side. I like to place them inside of the frame as I'm gluing the other piece down so I can make sure the end pieces that cross line up perfectly. And again, I'm putting this on the bottom part of the piece of wood so it doesn't ooze up through the top. So now that I have this together, it has a little bit of weight to it and I wanna add even more stability to make sure these three frames don't come apart. So I'm gonna take some of these smaller craft sticks that you can get at Dollar Tree and hot glue those in between where each one of the frames meets. So you'll have four on the back, but make sure you push them over enough so that you don't see it from the side when you hang your piece up. Of course, repeat this with your other one and now you have a pair of beautiful wooden shutters. I love how these turned out. They look gorgeous just by themselves, but they also look really beautiful as a grouping with a nice picture or something in the center. Using four of Dollar General's wooden garden stakes. They are three quarters of an inch square. They sell for a dollar a piece. We're gonna cut two of those down to 24 and 5 eighths of an inch, and the other two down to 18 and 1 quarter of an inch to create a frame. I'm gonna have the top and bottom piece rest on top of the two side pieces. So once I know everything's gonna be square, I'm going to take a drill bit and drill a hole through the bottom piece into the side piece and then I can attach this with a screw. So I pre-drilled my hole to make sure that my wood does not split as I put the screw in. I did that for all four corners. Now we're gonna use four of Dollar Tree's very long barbecue skewers. We actually end up only needing three of those. 
I'm going to give each of this two coats of white chalk paint. So I painted the entire frame front and back, as well as each one of those barbecue skewers. Using two of Dollar Tree's garden fences, we're going to cut the outside edging pieces off. Now you can use a utility knife and score this and then break it off, but I'm just going to use my tin snips because it cuts fairly straight and it makes this work very easy. So I'll trim those two outside edges down as well as the other two outside edges and you want to get it as close and as straight as possible and then cut each of the bottom stake parts off and you'll do this for both of the frames. And this is how it should look once you cut all those tabs off. We're going to take our second piece and we're going to flip it around so that they are facing opposite directions. Now, if need be, you could take some sandpaper and sand that down to make sure all the edges are very smooth. To attach these, I'm going to flip them over. So now we're looking at the back side of the fencing and I'm taking some regular craft sticks and I'm going to glue them to the seams between the two. So they're just butted up to each other and I'm squeezing it together to make sure I get a nice tight fit and then hot gluing those sticks down. I'm leaving a little bit hanging off the edge of the two outside pieces, and you'll see why in just a minute. So once I have that middle secure, I'm going to take some of the craft sticks and cut them down into smaller pieces to attach to the outside part of the frame. So you wanna have about the same amount hangover as we did on the middle piece but you don't want to be able to see the other end that we're gluing down through the fencing. So just hold that in place and let the hot glue set up. And I'm going to add one at the bottom and at the top. And I'll do that on the other side as well. So you'll have two craft sticks on each of the sides, the little two small pieces. And then where each of the arches are in the fence, we're going to add one in the very center on each one of these at the top and at the bottom. Again, try to make sure you have about the same distance for each one of the sticks hanging over from the fencing. Now, once we have all of this in place, I'm gonna take my hair dryer, go through and try to remove all of those glue strands and what my hair dryer doesn't get, I'll go back in and pick those off. Now, I'm taking some black chalk paint and I'm painting the ends of those craft sticks and the sides just in case you could see those when we put it on our frame. And then again, I'm going to paint the outside edging as well. To assemble this, I'm going to place the fencing upside down and those little craft sticks are going to rest on the back side of our frame. So once I get everything in there, make sure it's going to fit and push it down. You're going to have a little bounce in the middle, but that's okay. We're going to fix that when we get towards the end of the project. I'm going to lift up and glue each one of those craft sticks down all the way around the frame. And now when you flip it over, it's going to have, like I said, a little bounce in the middle, but that's okay. This is where these barbecue skewers are going to come into play. So I want to put one in between each of the seams of the arches, and we're going to create like a faux window. So I'm holding that in place, making my marking, cutting that down, and then I'm just going to set it in there for right now before I glue it down. If need be, you want a nice tight fit, so if it doesn't fit perfectly, just run it over some sandpaper until you can get that to fit in there nice and tight. I did that for the three sections where all of those meet, and then I can go in and glue each one of those barbecue skewers down. Then I'm going to take the other barbecue skewer and measure the distance between each one of the barbecue skewers in the frame that we just placed. So again, I'm just gonna hold it up there, mark it, make sure everything lines up, and then I can go back in and glue each one of these down. That's gonna take the bounce out of your fencing, but it's also gonna create this beautiful faux wrought iron window. Now you can hang this up with the picture hanging command strips, or you could put a hanger on the back, or you could just lean it up against something and not hang it up. I love how this project turned out and I cannot wait to share with you how well it looks with our next project. We're gonna use that short piece of the garden stake that we cut off. This one measures about 11 and 3 eighths of an inch. We're gonna measure down four and one quarter of an inch from the top 
and use our handheld saw to cut that off. Sand all of those rough edges down, and then I'm using a drill bit, and I'm gonna drill in the center of that shorter piece on each end. So once we get those done, you're gonna to try to get it as centered as possible. We're gonna drill a hole in the end, not the end with the point, the other end, in the center of that towards the top, and we're gonna drill that all the way through. This is how we're going to connect this piece to the shorter piece. Now once I remove all of the little rough edges, I'm gonna apply a screw through the piece with the pointed end, and we're gonna screw that into one of those pre-drilled holes on the other end. So it should be looking something like this, like an upside down L. For the other pre-drilled hole, I'm going to add a hook. This is just some hooks that I already had on hand. I think you maybe can find these at Walmart. I'm going to hand screw that in. Now you could leave it up or you can leave the hook down. I kind of like it facing up, so that's the way I'm gonna leave mine. We're also using two of these LED hanging lamps from Dollar Tree. We're gonna remove that light bulb piece and then we're gonna tuck our light strand back down inside of that so that we can tape this off because we're gonna be painting everything. I just placed some tape in there and make sure that I had everything covered up so when I spray paint this, the paint does not get down inside of that. And I also flipped it over and I'm going to tape off that top piece because I don't want the paint to get down into all of those mechanisms for the light. So I find it's easier to just apply your tape and then flip it over, use a utility knife to trim off the excess so everything's nice and clean with your tape. We're gonna be using one of these wired baskets from Dollar Tree. They measure five inches in diameter at the bottom and eight inches at the top. We're also gonna be spraying all of this with some Krylon Fusion matte black paint. So I'm making a pair, so I have duplicates of everything. I have it set out with the lampshades and I've taken the hangers off. Then we have our wood pieces that we put together as well as our wire baskets. This is only gonna take one coat of the black spray paint. Allow that to thoroughly dry and don't forget to flip everything over and make sure you spray the inside piece. Now, once everything has dried, I'm going to bring it back inside and remove my tape from the bottom and then remove it from the top. So I still want the top to be black. I'm going to paint that with a paintbrush and some black chalk paint. So this way I can very carefully paint that and make sure paint does not get down inside of the little lamp to ruin any of the mechanisms that will make the lamp work. Once dried, we can now take our string lights and feed that back into the light bulb and twist that back in. And I'm going to make sure that it's going to work before I move forward. It is so pretty. Now, once I have all of those to put back together, it is time for us to make our hanging lamp. So this is the bottom part of the basket. I'm going to set the lampshade underneath the basket and then attach it with the hook or the hanger that came with it into the center section of each of the lamps. Then we can just hang that right on top of the hook that we have on our wood piece. Now for mine, I'm gonna hang them up with two of the pitcher hangers on the back, but you could also screw this straight into the wall. And you guys, look how beautiful they turned out for about $2.50 each, and they are gorgeous with our faux wrought iron window. You guys, if you have a favorite project out of today's video, please let me know in the comments down below. I always love to know which one is your favorite. Thank you so much for watching. Please take care, and I will see you next time.